If you haven't noticed by now, there's something that should be pretty obvious about me, and that's that I am a huge fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. Even if you haven't watched my multiple dissertations on this series that I've made, which are of course not nearly the last of which I'll be making, please watch. You'll still nigh instantly notice my love for the series based on my channel mascot, my intro music, the everything. But one thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is how with Sonic's reputation somewhat on the up and up with the success of Sonic Mania and the recent theatrical film, and the decline of society as we know it, it actually seems like more people previously resistant to touching Sonic Media are interested in diving in, maybe even for the first time. And when that happens, the inevitable question of which I get asked rather often, actually, is a simple one. Where do I start? And honestly, while Sonic 1 seems like the obvious answer, I wouldn't be comfortable being so quick to jump to it as the only solution. After all, Sonic the Hedgehog has so many different incarnations, properties, mediums, it means a little something different to every fan out there. And because of that, and the sheer volume of material surrounding it, it can be an imposing thought to enter its world completely blind to its storied history. That's why I thought I'd make a little guide to tour you prospective future hedgehog enthusiasts through the twisted world that is the Sonic franchise. Not the Sonic fandom, that's a very different story. Whether you want to like Sonic games, Sonic cartoons, Sonic comics, or even Sonic pasta, I will try to give you the skinny on what exactly will scratch your itch. Except for the pasta, I'm pretty sure you can't get that anymore, and if you found an old can, I cannot vouch for your safety in eating. Anywho, put on your speed shoes and your thinking caps, step into Sonic's schoolhouse. <laughs> Just kidding, don't do that. It's horrifying. And let me give you a beginner's guide to Sonic the Hedgehog. So first, we're gonna talk about the main medium that Sonic resides in. Ancient folkloric painting and games. We're talking about video games. Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis released in 1991 is the most starting point starting place you could ever hope to be starting from. It's the game that started everything after all. It introduces us to our primary series icons for which each continuity would inevitably mold themselves around. That being Sonic, the eccentric fun loving vagabond teenager with a penchant for adventure and wisecrackery and a hatred for oppression and cruelty, and Dr. Eggman, otherwise known in Western regions until 1999 as Dr. Robotnik. Look, I know, don't at me. A maniacal, egotistical scientist eager to impose a mechanical empire on the peaceful nature around him by capturing and forcing small animals to do his biddings as robotic slave laborers. There's definitely a bit of an environmentalist undertone to the whole. The game sees Sonic travel across a handful of stages from the lush vegetation of Green Hill Zone all the way to the industrialist nightmare known as Scrap Brain Zone. This is obviously the first of the series, so while it is the perfect starting point for the purists out there, it is also mechanically one of the weaker of the early titles. Despite not being bad, Sonic the Hedgehog really peaks in its first level, where it takes advantage of Sonic's core appeal, his unique physics-based movement and sense of speed he can gain via skillful traversal of the level's terrain. Green Hill Zone is like a psychedelic jungle gym, and though we might be tired of seeing it rehashed all the time in recent games, there is a reason it's so iconic to begin with. It might be one of the most important introductory levels in video game history. However, after that thrill ride has ended, the rest of the game just sort of pitters out. There's not never any sense of speed or excitement after this, but the game struggles to find a lasting energy for its own identity in lieu of playing it safe with more traditional platforming challenges. And as a result, it takes Sonic's core appeal and whittles it down to a lot of awkward platforming and pace breaking standing around. Sonic 1 is a fine first game in a franchise, but that franchise would only continue to pick up from this point on. But it's very obviously the first, and therefore the least focused of its kind, at least from the era arguably. A better place to start would probably be Sonic the Hedgehog 2, released in 1992, which not only introduces Sonic's sidekick, the two-tailed fox Miles Tails Prower, and adds the iconic spin dash to Sonic's moveset, but is honestly probably the purest distillation of a classic Sonic platformer's core appeal into one product. You could obviously argue subsequent sequels elaborated on Sonic 2's strengths even more, but if you wanted to play a simple, fun, easy-to-pick-up Sonic game, 
that gets everything about the series focused into one place, you're gonna want to start with this one. There's a reason a lot of kids' first Sonic experience was Sonic 2. The sense of thrilling speed and momentum-based platforming physics is back on full display here, and is even prouder than ever because the level design has seen some drastic overhauls from Sonic 1, and Sonic's speed cap has been significantly reduced. Though structurally they may look similar, they have less traditional platforming designs in tow, focusing instead on the kind of unique terrain that made Sonic so fun to control in Green Hill Zone. If Sonic 1 was a showcase of a concept in the making, Sonic 2 is the delivery of its promise, and it absolutely nailed the landing. The special stages to grab the Chaos Emeralds are kind of trial and error and pain in the ass, but at most you miss out on a slightly cosmetically different ending and the ability to play as Super Sonic, another new addition to this game, who is admittedly pretty badass. Ultimately though, missing out on the Emeralds is nowhere close to a deal breaker, and this all combined makes Sonic 2 a near-perfect starting point on the game side of things. Sonic the Hedgehog 3! And Knuckles is probably where a lot of people would insist that you start, and I don't think it's a bad choice by any means, but get ready if you decide to take this one on instead of two, because you're going to be tested. Sonic 3 is the most expansive and sprawling 2D Sonic game of its era, and ambition is tattooed over its very soul. This game is incredibly dense, with a veritable assload of stages that put the other two games' stage roster to shame. The platforming challenges are varied and exciting, elemental shields add more to the minute-to-minute -minute action of utilizing Sonic's moveset to your advantage, Tails and Knuckles being playable adds whole new dimensions to the game's playstyle, and god, the visual storytelling with no dialogue in this game is mwah, chef kiss, okay hand emoji. Sonic 3 and K is commonly regarded as the best game in the series by many people for a really good reason. It's a damn fine culmination of everything good about what came before it refined into something truly special and fittingly epic of scope. What I think might be a bit intimidating about this game as an entry point, however, depends on how confident you feel in your ability to adjust to classic Sonic gameplay. If you need time to learn the ropes, I think Sonic 2 is your better bet for getting your feet in the shallow end. However, if you're already experienced with platform games and think you can decently grasp concepts laid out in front of you rather quickly, then Sonic 3 and K is some of the highest height of the series' prestige. And whether it is your entry point into the franchise or not, it is absolutely an essential play. Okay, let's cover some in-betweens now real quick before I get to my next major point. Sonic CD. Should this be your start? Short answer is probably not, even though I like it. The longer answer goes as follows. Sonic CD is sort of a strange hybrid of the design sensibilities of Sonic 1 and 2. Being an intermediary child in development between them sort of set Sonic CD on a course for Black Sheep Syndrome from the moment it was designated as a title for the ill-fated Sega CD add-on to the Genesis. Does this mean that Sonic CD itself is bad? Well, it depends on who you ask, but I tend to think no. Sonic CD is still a perfectly fun game in its own right, with a lot of stylistic value worth appreciating, especially with its animated intro and ending cutscenes, and eclectic atmospheric dual soundtracks for the respective region releases. What makes Sonic CD a strange beast to tame for a newcomer, however, aside from its slightly more marginal obscurity, is its design. The levels are often pretty labyrinthian for a Sonic title, and though I definitely say that it allows for more high-speed action than, say, Sonic 1, it's not nearly as focused and sharp as Sonic 2, and that, in combination with its somewhat clunky and awkward time travel mechanic, makes for a game that, while stylish and charming, is just a bit too much for a newbie to probably take in properly. By all means, play it, but maybe with a bit more experience under your belt. Sonic 3D Blast is just a straight up, no, right out of the gate. It's the last of the main Genesis lineup and was outsourced in development from Sonic Team to Traveler's Tales, which to their credit, they have made some pretty good things in the past. The game is sort of a product of its awkward place in time, to be honest, uh, not quite. 3D Sonic game trying to capitalize on the eagerness of its fanbase to see Sonic make the third dimension leap that Super Mario was already enjoying on the N64. What resulted was an awkward, slow-going bird collection game in an isometric view which, while not the most offensive video game out there, is certainly lacking in what makes a very good or interesting Sonic game. 
This one isn't the worst that the series has to offer by any means, but it's hardly worth being your introduction to the series, and is one I feel safely worth regarding as a pass for newcomers. If you're the kind of person that values a real 3D game though, and not just a fake one that wears a misnomer on its sleeve, it's now time to talk about Sonic Adventure. Released in 1998 for the Sega Dreamcast, or more commonly on GameCube, Steam, whatever. In addition to being the first 3D Sonic game, this is also the first game that kickstarted the modern incarnation of the franchise, helmed by Yuji Uekawa's magnificently graffiti-inspired redesigns of the characters. If you're not looking to start with classic cutesy Sonic and you want to find where all the butt rock is at, this is where you'll find it. Adventure is still one of my favorite games of the series, but for newcomers, I will acknowledge that it's a bit inscrutable and difficult to get a grasp of. The game has like six playable characters with their own semi-unique playstyles, and though each of them has a tutorial that you can read through, the very nature of Sonic Adventure as a game is a bit of a patchwork quilt that's at high risk of tearing if you shake it a bit too much. Sonic stages are easily some of my favorite 3D Sonic content out there, but a cross-section of slightly more difficult to grasp secondary characters, cheesy 90s voice acting, and stilted cutscene presentation makes Sonic Adventure a bit less timeless than its 16-bit counterparts. It's a fine first entry into the series, but it's one I would exercise some caution over if you need to adjust more gradually. If you need a more detailed dive into the game and my opinions on it, I actually have a full essay piece on it in my video backlog as well. Shameless plug, shameless plug. But enough going back, let's go forward to a title that probably needs no introduction. Sonic Adventure 2, released on the Dreamcast in 2001 on Sonic's 10th anniversary. Although most kids would end up playing the battle port for GameCube, and later the game would again be ported to HD consoles and Steam. Sonic Adventure 2 is easily one of the most dramatic plots in the series' history. The introduction point of fan favorite Shadow the Hedgehog, and features three playstyles split across two different story campaigns and teams of characters, which all tie together in the end for a final story segment. The game also includes an insane quantity of extra content, which includes the highly popular Chow Garden, which while present in the prior game is much more fleshed out and mechanically dense here than it is there. Some people play this game for this stuff alone. I personally prefer it between the main campaign's levels, but I do understand the appeal. They are just so darn cute. Sonic Adventure 2 is a lot more streamlined in the gameplay department than SA1, and it shows, from its slightly more linear level design to its sleek, overpowering sense of style. It is still one of the most fondly regarded games in the franchise's history, despite more recently divisive opinions on the internet era. And though I would argue the characters perhaps aren't as immediately established newcomers here as they would be in an earlier title, this served as the entry point for a ton of kids I knew growing up, many of whom continued in years after to be dedicated Sonic fans. With that all being said, it might even be a better entry point than SA1 is, though its level of quality in comparison to its predecessor is still something that's something of a battleground for various fan factions. If my nearly hour-long essay of made a year after the priors didn't already make that clear, yeah, well, there you go. Regardless, if you want to know what 3D Sonic is all about, you can't go wrong with SA2. Sonic Heroes might be the antithesis answer to the density I fear might ward people off from Adventure 1 or 2. While on the onset, it might appear even more hectic than ever, having 12 playable characters, the gimmick of Heroes has them all grouped into threes, and each team having more or less the same mechanical playstyle, if not slightly different objectives or levels of difficulty. Sonic Heroes was the first 3D Sonic game that marked the beginning of Sonic's existence in a post-Sega console market, and therefore was the first properly multi-platform mainline Sonic game, having released on PS2, GameCube, Xbox, and PC. The teams are comprised of a speed type for Sonic-style platforming, a flight type for slightly slower and airborne traversal with homing shots, and a power type, which isn't quite as nimble as the speed type on ground, but makes up for it in raw destructive force. Eat my leg! Each level is basically set up like a typical 3D Sonic stage, only the challenges you'll have to overcome will test your ability to utilize each team member efficiently. 
Sonic Heroes is one of those games in the series that's slightly contested in terms of quality, but for the most part, I generally see the game's reception as mostly positive, and know quite a few people whose first Sonic game was this one. I've actually come to really enjoy it a lot more than I used to in recent years, to be completely honest. This all combined with the fact that the story is extremely simple, despite having a chunky amount of character dialogue, also makes Heroes a really convenient place for newcomers to just interact with the characters and see how their personalities are and how they bounce off of each other in relationships. It's nothing Oscar-worthy, obviously, but it is a fun, compact story that communicates itself decently well to even a Sonic Virgin audience. Oh, I shouldn't have said it like that. And that combined with the decently fun gameplay and the unique team mechanics makes this a great entry point for 3D fans. What is not a great entry point, however, for 3D fans is Shadow the Hedgehog. This game has been memed to death, and honestly, there are a litany of reasons I could get into as to why, but I think I may do that more comprehensively someday. <clears throat> so I'll bite my tongue for the most part right now. What you need to know about why you should avoid this as a series newcomer, however, is pretty simply that this game wasn't made for you. It is an incredibly insulated piece of request fulfillment for a fanbase rabid for new Shadow content that turned out divisively. I tend to think the story is a huge waste of potential that ultimately says and does little to nothing at all, and the branching pathway system is incredibly shallow. The gameplay is constantly fighting its own design sensibilities with enemy ambushes, bullshit missions, and tedious repetitive play that is only made more unforgivable by the dreadfully ugly environment. Oh god, that's such bullshit. Repulsively bad voice acting and insanity-inducing requirements to play every variant path in order to unlock the final story segment. The only forgivable aspects of it to me are, once again, the great soundtrack and the sort of befuddled joy I get from the Dark Path mission that instructs you to kill the president. <laughs> it is a dreadful experience from start to finish, in other words. And I cannot recommend enough that you, as a franchise newcomer, or even as a veteran, should avoid it like the plague. Unless you want to have a good laugh for a while, I mean, it's good for that. Speaking of avoiding things like the plague, Sonic 06 exists. What a hot take this is in the year of our Lord 2020, yay, I am unique. We all know at this point that Sonic 06 is the most reviled, loathed, and mocked part of this franchise. We all know it was half-baked in the oven and taken out while it was mushy, left to the tides of time, presented at the Thanksgiving dinner table as a slightly disassembled, structurally flimsy, and dust-tasting nightmare. We all know that Sonic kisses a human princess. We know, we know, we know, we know. I don't need to tell you that the presentation is bad, that the art style is uncanny, or that Sonic can exist at the same time as a photorealistic dog for some reason. I don't need to tell you that there's more plot contrivances and logic failings than a Doctor Who fanfiction, and that even the occasionally decent level design is hampered by a game full of mechanical failings, stiff controls, and bizarre glitches, that the voice acting is somehow even worse than Shadow the Hedgehogs, and stands as the pinnacle of poor performance in this series' history of already controversial voice work. I literally left a blooper in the finished game. None of this is something that you don't probably already know. Sonic 06 exists now as a sort of stain on the franchise's legacy, but it also marks the low point that Sega would, at the very least, realize that they needed to come back from. As it is now, it remains as somewhat of a interesting character study of what happens when uninhibited ambition meets production crunch. And what results is a broken mess of a weak foundation trying to support a castle on its cracking ground. It is a train wreck. But it's kind of beautiful that the train tried so hard anyway. Regardless, don't make this your first Sonic experience. Save it for when you're deep enough to appreciate its bewildering persistence in having existed at all. Also, it's better than Shadow the Hedgehog. Hot take! <laughs> Ambition can take you pretty far, though, and Sonic Unleashed is proof enough that it can bring you back out of the pit and into the light again. In the first of what most fans refer to as the Boost Games, of which Sonic has most recently trended toward, Sonic Unleashed sees Sonic in a decently simple but still edgily epic globetrotting adventure to reassemble the broken planet that Eggman cracked to release an all-powerful eldritch demon god that looks like it comes right out of Bloodborne. This is also the game that the Werehog comes from. Yeah, make your jokes now, get it out of your system. Yep, he's furry, he's big, bear. 
Please don't do that Google search. Okay, now that you're done with that, let's get smart. Sonic Unleashed is pretty good, actually. Sure, the Werehog isn't the most fun Sonic style of gameplay out there, but even if it's a bit repetitive, it's certainly not anywhere close to terrible. And the daytime stages as Sonic, while perhaps a bit less substantive than most would prefer out of Sonic level design, is still one hell of a thrill ride. However, would I recommend this as a first entry? Probably not, honestly. While I do really like Sonic Unleashed, it is easily the most challenging boost game in the lineup, despite being the first of its kind. And that sort of trial and error level of difficulty for new players, combined with the slightly more sluggish Werehog, would, I think, make for a pretty miserable starting point. Even if on its own I quite like the game, save this one for later. But don't skip it, necessarily. Just tuck it into your back pocket. That opening cutscene is sick, though. What's probably a better way to dip into the boost gameplay is another game I saw newcomers flock to as the first of their Sonic journey, that being 2010's Sonic Colors for the Nintendo Wii. With a much simpler plot than the usual, written decently by two guys who proclaim to know nothing about Sonic, the game follows Sonic and Tails trying to stop Eggman from enslaving cute aliens with color powers called Wisps to power his intergalactic amusement park. Sonic Colors is plenty charming stylistically, has a killer soundtrack, and while a bit short, plays mostly like a game that only contains the best aspects of Unleashed with less cheap death involved. In retrospect, however, it does contain a lot of stiff faux 2D platforming, and I think this easily is the weakest area that Colors suffers in. If we're discounting Pontac's writing from the equation, <laughs> it's the definition of a safe Sonic game, and because of that, it may actually be a great place to begin if you're the type that prefers getting closer to the current lineup. Tread carefully, but at the end of the day, if this is your pick, it's a fine enough one to go with. Sonic 4, on the other hand... Oh, oh no, this is where safe just becomes bad. In essence, it's not the most offensively bad game out there by any means, but... Both editions of this episodic return to form that Sonic Team tried to do leaves a lot to be desired. Lazy level design, locales that do nothing but crib from the stronger 2D Sonic titles, and the truly god-awful recreations of their respective physics. And you have some of the truly most autopilot-feeling Sonic games of all time. Not to mention the bland plastic graphical style, the sort of weird lack of dedication to the classic aesthetics, and some ear-gratingly bad Genesis synth recreations for the soundtrack. Uh... Sonic Generations, on the other hand, is everything that Sonic 4 wishes it was. While the writing is still as lackluster as ever, the plot hardly matters in the face of one of the most charming and well-executed 3D games in the franchise which wears a boastful pride for its series' highs and lows alike like a badge of honor, and coasts on the familiarity and fondness therein that every bit of it has to offer. I'd say that a lot of the nostalgia appeal of the game will obviously be lost on newcomers because of their lack of familiarity with the content being referenced, but as a selection showcase of what's to love about the Blue Hedgehog from a semi-recreation of 2D Sonic gameplay to more expansive, thrill-inducing boost Sonic gameplay, it's an extremely successful attempt to cram as much high-octane joy as possible into a great anniversary title. A fair starting point for sure. And quality-wise, a damn good one. But when concerning nostalgia, it's only fair that we dial back a little bit. There are uh, still other anti-recommendations I need to offer up, but I'd like to take a moment to say the Sonic Advance games. Yeah, these were pretty worth bringing up, to be honest, because even now that the GBA library is much more overlooked, these are still excellent titles in their own right, and excellent gateways into the 2D Sonic gameplay for newcomers, with a few added bells and whistles of their own for good measure. The first Sonic Advance is a bit rough around the edges, but still an excellent show of versatility for Nintendo's handheld. Sonic Advance 2 is probably my favorite of the trilogy, with an emphasis on breakneck speed really being ramped up in combination with creative runner bosses. Some people really hate these. I, I don't really mind them, to be honest. I think they're pretty cool. Though the special stages are kind of bull. <laughs> Sonic Advance 3 is a bit of a divisive one, however, featuring a team mechanic that was mixed in its reception, hub worlds that feel bland and intrusive, and some questionable level design at times, particularly with frustrating enemy placement and a plethora of bottomless pits. Still, though, it does have a lot of charm. From the many creative boss encounters to the game's unique Eggman lackey... Jemerl? J... Jem... L... 
G Merle? Gmer Still probably not a good first pick. Another one to tuck back into your pocket. However, this was the last game to feature voice clips of the original voice cast from Sonic Adventure onward, and the last proper appearance of the wonderful Dean Bristow as Dr. Eggman before he unfortunately passed away. It's a fun time, if not gameplay-wise, at least for the memories that it provokes. All right, it's time to get critical again. Whew, we've been pretty happy for a few minutes here. This is a Sonic video. That's not what people want. If the YouTube algorithm has told me anything, it's that Sonic bad give me views. So instead of ragging on games I actually love, allow me to present some good reason for why I think several others from this time period would be bad first forays into the colorful cartoon world. Now, keep in mind that not all of these are even bad games in my opinion, but for one reason or another, I don't find them particularly newbie friendly. They're better saved for later, if they're touched upon at all. Sonic Lost World is probably one of the least genuinely offensive ones on this list, because Lost World itself isn't actually that horrible of a game in isolation. It has some neat mechanics, if a bit undercooked and underexplained, and the levels can be a bit of good fun if you know what to expect. What's so weird about its placement in the Sonic franchise, however, is that it hardly feels like a Sonic game. The platforming, for one, is intensely slower than usual, even while not accounting for the fact that this game gives Sonic a run button. His physics are just kind of heavy in general, to be honest. I never really felt satisfied or in much control when trying to get Sonic to jump in this game. It always feels like a struggle to get him well off enough the ground. The returning color powers are also pretty useless, and the whole game just radiates this sort of reclusive stubbornness in trying anything remotely new. At its wackiest, it feels like a messy science experiment that doesn't really know quite what it wants to be. And when it's playing it safe, it feels more like a Mario game than a Sonic game. And not even the best Mario game. And I didn't even come to a Sonic game to play a Mario game either, so... You know, the writing is also just atrocious. The story is middling and typical and goes almost all of nowhere. The dialogue is groan inducing and it really becomes more apparent than ever before that Pontac has zero clue what these characters are actually supposed to be like beyond quick blurbs and internet stereotypes. You could do far worse for a first Sonic game, but this is one you really should be seeking better alternatives to if you can help it. Knuckles Chaotix. So oh boy, now we're getting down to the more niche stuff. This is a game for the ill-fated 32X add-on to the Sega Genesis, starring Knuckles in the lead role, along with the Chaotix, a group of characters who first debuted here, and would later appear sans Mighty the Armadillo in Sonic Heroes. Rest your soul, you poor sweet bastard. It's a really beautiful looking game with a great soundtrack and superficially similar gameplay to most classic Sonic games, but unfortunately the biggest problem with it is that it's boring. The ring tether mechanic that this game tried to set itself apart with ended up becoming so cumbersome in left to right progressing stages because of its tendency to bounce around and slam into stuff that the stages became huge bottom to top gauntlets with barely any real enemies or hazards to deal with. What you get as a result is a game that's really damn long and has almost nothing to do for the majority of it. Plus, it's not even a game featuring Sonic as a playable character. So again, give it a pass. The same sense of frustration and lack of substance translates pretty well over to most 8-bit Sonic titles, with the Game Gear Master System releases of Sonic 1 and 2 being pretty generally forgettable when not taxing. Sonic 1's 8-bit incarnation is better than Sonic 2's, I'll give it that much but it's still nowhere close to the level of its 16-bit original, although Bridge Zone is a great song. Sonic 2, in particular, features a lot of cheap BS just waiting to kill you, especially compounded by the awful screen crunch in the Game Gear versions. If you, for some reason, do ever want to touch these eventually, I'd recommend the Master System releases first, as they have better screen size and can obviously just account for a bigger field of view and minimize on the annoyance factor. Just stick with the Genesis titles over these, probably. Sonic Chaos on the Game Gear is kind of the opposite, however. In fact, this game is so easy that you'll have no trouble completing it in record time. The Emerald Hunting adds a bit more of a challenge, but really it's still nothing especially daunting. This would be a good first Sonic game for babies, maybe? But not for grown players. Triple Trouble is, uh, well, it's a little better than Chaos, but with it comes along some frustrating design choices, 
and undercooked gimmicks. Still, it's probably the best of the Game Gear series anyway, so it's not a bad game by any means. The Game Gear also featured some less-than-stellar spin-off material, like Sonic Labyrinth, a top-down puzzle platform game that uh... Sonic Blast tried to get back on track with 2D platforming gameplay, but combined with terrible collision and these god-awfully ugly faux 3D sprites, it's just not a good time. Total waste of your precious mental resources. Tails Sky Patrol and Tails Adventure are pretty good in their own rights, one being a sort of on-rails 2D shooter type of game, and the latter being a pretty solid Metroidvania-like game, with Tails using inventions to fight off an invading bird army. But neither of them are very much like typical Sonic games, so I wouldn't recommend these for first-timers purely on the basis that it just doesn't set the actual correct expectation. Still not bad games, just, you know, definitely worth checking out at some point. Oh yeah, and Sonic Drift 1 and 2 just kind of exist, I guess. Uh, play the console racing games over those. I don't really need to be the one to tell you that Sonic R is kind of a piece of crap game either. This one has been memed to death. Sonic the Fighters isn't too bad, but it really is just kind of a mid-tier fighting game with Sonic characters, so it's not like this is a great example of what the franchise has to offer. Sonic Shuffle is decent. It's a mediocre Mario Party clone with some cool original ideas and trippy aesthetics, but overall, decently skippable. Games like Sonic Spinball and Pinball Party, while fun in their own right, are also just more spin-off fodder. And while fine on their own, doesn't really reflect the main series' roots all that well. Sonic Battle is another fighting game for GBA, and is slightly better. It even has what I consider to be a pretty kick-ass story, actually. But again, a later investment to make. What doesn't need your time, however, is Sonic Chronicles, a desperately bad attempt at a Sonic RPG on DS made by Bioware, of all people. This game is just piss poor. There is pretty much nothing good about this. Avoid this like the plague. Instead, maybe pick up Sonic Rush or Sonic Rush Adventure for your DS needs. Those are actually pretty decent 2D handheld Sonic games that expand upon the design elements of Sonic Advance pretty well. They introduce Blaze the Cat, who has become a longtime fan favorite, and feature cool split-screen gameplay across the two screens. They even have the best controlling special stages in the whole series, in my opinion. Solid stuff. Actually managed to make me like a version of the halfpipe. That's a pretty big achievement. Sonic and the Secret Rings. Uh, this one is an on-rails game on the Wii, with a lot of cumbersome motion controls, and a decent, if not really weird, story. Reception on this one was pretty mixed, so while you may find something to like about it, I'd still say that it doesn't capture the series' spirit much on the gameplay side of things. Its sister sequel, Sonic and the Black Knight, is slightly better, in that the controls are a bit better, but you're still constantly swinging the Wiimote to hack and slash your way through things, and it can get pretty tiring on the wrists. Fortunately, one thing that Black Knight has going for it is a truly awesome soundtrack, and a pretty solid story for Sonic writing standards, frankly. It's not a perfect game, and still not what I'd call a good first Sonic game, but it may be worth giving a shot later down the line if you find yourself drawn to any of its elements. Okay, let's see what else... <clears throat> Sonic Riders was a pretty decent racing game. Cool concept, you know? <clears throat> Uh, it was mechanically dense, though, like, really mechanically dense, and really doesn't do a very good job of teaching the player how it works. For someone who worked through all of its kinks, it can be very enjoyable, but that's assuming that you have the patience to trudge through your inevitable hours of not knowing what the hell you're doing. Zero Gravity is a pretty decent sequel for what it's worth, and Free Riders is only playable on Kinect, so... I'm sure you know how most people felt about that one. Sonic Forces is the newest of the main 3D lineup, as of this video's creation. And I'm sure you might have heard a lot about it. Is it drab? Yes. Uninspired? Yes. Repetitive? Yes. Cribbing uselessly from more nostalgia-baiting boring BS? Yes. Classic Sonic's in it again, but worse? Yes. Modern stages last about 30 seconds? Yes. Stage designed by three people who have never worked on a Sonic game before? Yes. But... You can make an OC, and their stages are kinda decent. 6 out of 10, the most It Exists Sonic game I have ever played. Don't make this your first one, or your last one, or even your next one. <sighs> okay, fine! Sonic Boom, Rise of Lyric, on Wii U. 
it's one of those games I really wish I didn't have to comment on here, but alas, I know that this is a recent stain on the franchise's reputation, closest in ferocity to the decades-long tongue lashing that Sonic 06 received when it came out. And does it deserve it? Well, yeah, it's true that it is absolutely unfinished. It's true that at its best, it's just a generic platform beat-em-up starring Sonic and pals always traveling at a measured pace. It's also true that this is a spin-off game developed by a different studio and based on a licensed cartoon in a different continuity than that of the main games. Does that excuse it for being garbage? Not at all. Even kids deserve better than this shovelware. But that's what it is. Shovelware. Not a main Sonic title. It's more like the Ed Ed Nettie on Xbox version of Sonic. And in my opinion, it's not even really worth paying much attention to. Shattered Crystal and Fire and Ice, the two 3DS Sonic Boom games, are probably much better wastes of time, being that they're sort of Metroidvania-esque, but I've never played them. And again, I'd still hardly call those very Sonic-like. Whew! Okay, negativity stream out of the way. Let's get back to talking about some cool stuff now. Sonic Mania, God's gift to us mortals and proof that despite not being on speaking terms with us, he hasn't entirely given up on the human race. I mean, well, at the time he hadn't, but. Sonic Mania is everything to love about 2D Sonic packaged into a beautifully designed, immaculately crafted package with gorgeous pixel art, insanely good music, and even some great spins on old zone stages. Some people complain that this game didn't have more original levels than callback levels, and to be fair to them, I get that. I would have liked to see more original stages too. But even so, I can't be mad. This game is something I can pick up and play every day in my life and never get tired of it. It's just that good. In terms of ultimate classic Sonic gameplay, I'm sure many would probably argue that Sonic 3 and K is more of an epic masterpiece, but Sonic Mania is well worth the time and money. To a lot of people, I know this made an excellent entry into the franchise and convinced a lot of them that Sonic did have something going on after all. But if you can help it, I would stave off Mania for as long as you can bear, because the amount of sheer fan service in this game is astounding. And the more you know about the franchise's history beforehand, the more you'll be able to appreciate it when you see it for the first time. Still, either way, a stellar game. Absolutely highly recommended. Oh, I uh, guess we finished the games portion. We did it, gamers! Don't think I've left you entertainment fans out to dry, though. I know you like your television around here, so I'll throw you a bone now. If you want to get into animated Sonic content, let's talk about where to get you started. First, of course, let's start with the most iconic and one of the most stood-by animated incarnations of Sonic that the character has ever seen. Sonic the Hedgehog, otherwise known as Sat AM because of its Saturday morning time slot, was one of the first animated incarnations for the Sonic franchise in the West. This version of events takes a much darker approach to the world of Sonic and casts him not as a hero fighting to stop a maniacal scientist who wants to take over the planet, but as a freedom-fighting eco-terrorist teenage renegade operating out of a hidden base with his similarly freedom-fighting friends in a remote forest village, going on missions and staging giant plans of attack against the tyrannical rule of a truly imposing Dr. Robotnik, who, crucially, has already won the battle for the planet and controls every facet of it with his iron grip. That's becoming scarily more relevant nowadays. It's genuinely a really well-written show with a lot of pathos and excellent atmosphere. And even despite its, at times, cheesy writing, the characters are all very fleshed out and extremely likable. Ah, the plots can be really engaging. I'd say more about this one because I could talk about it all day, but I kind of already did, with a previous video essay outlining everything I love about this show in superbly explicit detail, along with a lot of history about its production and ultimately depressing cancellation. If you want to know more about Sat AM, I would highly recommend giving that video a watch. I've been told that it's probably one of my best. And I've also been told by a lot of people who didn't watch it and only read the text in the thumbnail that I'm an SJW because I made it. <laughs> but for now, just know that if you need a compelling Sonic television experience, this series, while not particularly game accurate, is certainly worth loving in its own right, and rightfully hosts a vibrant fan base to this very day, despite being canceled over 20 years ago. It's a keeper. Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog was the lighter-toned of the two 90s Sonic cartoons that debuted in 1993. 
being less like a dramatic action show and more of a Looney Tunes cartoon with Sonic, Tails, and Robotnik. And my favorite of all Eggman henchmen in any series incarnation, Scratch and Grounder. These dudes are just so funny. They really are like half the reason I even come back to this show nowadays. Not to say that the show is terrible or anything. It's certainly really cheesy, full of 90s schlock and totally tubular vernacular, bro. But it's just a lot of innocent fun, honestly. And while still far from game accurate, at least portrays the relationship between Sonic and Tails really well, and has a lot of high-speed hijinks to enjoy watching unfold. This cartoon also features the legendary portrayal of Robotnik by singer Long John Baldry, who despite sadly passing away in 2005, lives on through his many exploitable and hilarious voice clips from this very show. Sonic Underground, on the other hand, uh, it's probably the farthest out there from being even remotely game accurate, and even then it just sucks. It's kind of a meme of its own these days, and for good reason. It's pretty representative of how all over the place the brand image for Sonic was back in the day. Because of Sega's loose handling of the actual franchise image during that period of time, it is a perfect representation, visually speaking, of how many splinters exist in this community due to the truly inexhaustible amount of continuities or styles to speak for. And I'm sure Underground itself has its fans too, but suffice it to say, I am not one of them. If we're thinking of a late 90s Sonic animation, I have one other one that comes to mind much more frequently. Sonic the Hedgehog from 1996 is a direct-to-video OVA animated by Studio Pier Pierret Parrot. One of those things, it's like the clown, commonly known for their work on the hit series Naruto and Tokyo Ghoul. Apparently, this was supposed to be one big pilot pitch to the beginning of a prospective Sonic anime series. However, unfortunately, it never got picked up for a full production. And instead, all we have as a result are these pilot episodes, which were released combined into one 50-minute feature by ADV Films as Sonic the Hedgehog the Movie. The plot follows Sonic and Tails once again in a new original continuity where they live on planet Freedom and must try to stop a haywire robot generator created by Dr. Eggman to help save South Island, the president of it, and his cat girl anime daughter Sarah who has a crush on Sonic for some reason because of course she does. Knuckles also makes an appearance later on but seems to have been relegated to a simple treasure hunter that Sonic and Tails know as opposed to the guardian of the Master Emerald on the floating island. The main villain of the feature is Metal Sonic, who is finalized after Sonic is tricked into having his biodata copied. They have a pretty sick anime brawl in the North Pole during the climax, and it's genuinely pretty cool. The soundtrack to this OVA is also damn good, and the animation is pretty cool too, even if a bit dated by today's standards. Again, not the most accurate to the games, but at the time, it was at least far more adherent to them than any other animated Sonic properties. It's also pretty short and sweet, and I'd highly recommend it to any fan, as well as any prospective fan who wants to dip their toes into something small first to get a little taste of the characters. Since this exists sort of in licensing limbo at the moment, you can easily find both the subbed and the ADV dub version on YouTube in full with a quick search. Uh, new viewers, I'd recommend the Japanese with sub just because the dub is kind of eh, but like, I have nostalgia for it, if that's worth anything to you. Speaking of anime though, Sonic X. Yeah, this one was bound to come up, and to be honest, I do have somewhat mixed feelings about it. There are a lot of things to love about Sonic X, to be fair, and of all the animated properties in the Sonic franchise, this one still remains probably the most accurate to the canon, aesthetic, and overall tone of the mainline Sonic games. Yeah, it has the human characters that most people hate, and especially Chris, but it's a lot of fun at times, even if it can get a bit boring at others. Most people, I would argue, don't even know how good this show can be, though, considering most still just watch the 4Kids dub, without even knowing that 4Kids not only severely cut down on a lot of content they viewed as objectionable, but also removed outright emotion from certain scenes to lessen the blow of sadness.
I guess people just assume that because Sonic is a kids franchise that 4Kids wouldn't have changed this show that much, but that is absolutely not true. In addition, they completely replaced the original awesome soundtrack with something a lot more stereotypically Saturday morning cartoon-esque. As a result, the English version just really ends up butchering a lot of the original's content, especially when it comes to season three and the story of Cosmo. Seriously, do yourself a favor. If you have never seen the Japanese version of Sonic X, watch it. And if you only have time for a bit of it, watch season three in particular in Japanese. It's like secretly the best Sonic show ever, and you just don't know it yet. But you will. <clears throat> anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, Sonic X is a decent entry point. Yeah, let it pass. Sonic Boom is bad. Okay, okay, I know people are gonna really hate me for saying that. It's an unpopular opinion. A lot of people really like the Sonic Boom show. I get it. Don't worry if you like this series. I am not out to undercut that or tell you that you're wrong. I get it. This one is just kind of a pee for me because I've never really enjoyed the direction of the Sonic franchise's humor being directed not at the actual character dynamics, but the series itself. There's only so many times you can make meta jokes about how bad everyone thinks the Sonic games are before the people who actually like Sonic in your audience, you know, the people probably inclined to watch a Sonic cartoon in the first place, start to get a little restless over it. To top it all off, yeah, I know these are different canon variations of the characters, but a lot of them are just so unlike their game selves that I just don't even know why they bothered. A million shows like this could do well on Cartoon Network without having needed to be even Sonic related. And given how much they changed about it, I still don't know why they didn't just do that instead. But Nezumi, you said that you like Sonic Sat AM. It's not accurate to the games either. Yeah, but there's a difference. Sat AM Sonic, which can be a bit annoying at times, still generally acts pretty accurate to his character. I don't happen to think that Boom Sonic really does this. And also, Sonic Sat AM has the excuse of being very different from the games, because at the time, there wasn't that much material to work off of. In 1993, not even Sonic 3 and K was fully out, and the Sonic games that were out were pretty lax on story, and had no real official dialogue or characterization or what have you. They had to build up a foundation from very little information, and Sonic Boom, given the time it was created, just doesn't have this excuse. Like, at all. Still though, like I said, if you like this show, good on you. I know a lot of people enjoy it, and I'm glad you can. As a Sonic fan of many years though, this just doesn't do it for me. And I happen to think it's not exactly faithful to the material it's adapting, so I wouldn't personally recommend it myself. If it is your Sonic though, then hey, have at it. There's so many Sonics out there, it's bound to be that you'll have a preference for which one you like the most. And that's totally okay. The 2020 Sonic film though, eh, well, yeah, it's uh, pretty out there in terms of adaptation, but it's decent. I mean, okay, hear me out. I just had a lot of fun with it, okay? Masterpiece? No. Superbly game accurate? Hell no. Fun movie, though? Yeah. It also has a more emotionally vulnerable Sonic, which I super enjoy, considering that Sega seems by the day to get closer and closer to declaring that Sonic is the biggest boy who never even cries when his kids die. Oh, right, you're, uh... <clears throat> if you're new here, you might not know about the context for that one. Well, whew. Okay, strap in, folks. We're getting into the weird stuff. Good stuff still to come, yes. But there is a lot of waiting to do. Join me now for your time in the sunlight, comic book fans, because this is the path of a Sonic reader. Ah, the granddaddy, the big kahuna. Over 20 years in publication with a cavalcade of artists and writers, many excellent and many Ken Penders. Okay, but really, Archie Sonic the Hedgehog. What is there to say? I could say any number of things, like it starts off as a pretty typical gag comic that eventually ends up taking itself insanely seriously and has cosmic sized ass pulls all the time. I could say that Sonic in this comic, accounting for all the stuff he pulls off, could probably kill God. I could just stick to the surface and point out the hundreds of echidna OCs that Ken Penders invented to further the epic legend of his original messiah care, I mean Knuckles. But all of that is easy. All of that is child's play. You really want to talk about Archie Sonic? Well, uh, 
neither do I, really. I really don't have the time required to go through even a fraction of this crap right now. I have a whole dissection series dedicated to that, even though I rarely update it because it doesn't get enough views to be sustainable yet. Please support me on Patreon. But do I think Archie Sonic is good? Well, that's a really complicated question to answer. So complicated it might even be downright impossible, because this sucker ran for close to 300 issues, not even counting the wealth of side content and special issues, paperbacks, etc. This thing is huge! And because of the various people working on it, all with different and sometimes clashing views on the direction of the story, tone, and the characters should all take, it can at times be excellent storytelling with genuine emotion, heart, and incredible action and drama alike. At other times, it can be a sloppy, tone-deaf train wreck that's just way too up its own ass to say that it's still about Sonic the Hedgehog at the end of the day. It's just too vast and too multifaceted to say one way or the other. It just needs to be experienced to be understood. And even though you might not understand it, there are justifiably a lot of people who despise this continuity for the reputation its more questionable aspects gained for the franchise. But there are just as many people who adore this universe and its characters, flaws and all. I can't tell you to not pick it up, because I don't know your heart. You may fall in love with this or want to tear it to shreds. But if you're a comic books fan, you owe it to yourself to at least try. Fleetway UK's Sonic the Comic is a lot more of a weird case. This one is pretty beloved by a lot of people that grew up with it, and having read a good deal of it myself, I can definitely see the charm. There's a lot to like here. And although some of the artists can do pretty shoddy work, there's also issues that look pretty mesmerizing. This continuity is also host to some fun abnormalities, such as Kintobor and Robotnik hatching from a giant egg one time, uh, Amy's weird upwards hairstyle, which was a mistaken interpretation of one of her Sonic CD promo arts, and Super Sonic being a literal murderous psychopath hell-bent on killing Sonic's loved ones by taking control of his body. Yeah, it's pretty out there. Sonic himself is also kind of a huge dick in this comic. It's actually hilarious how genuinely mean he is. Like, all the time. Although you could probably chalk this up to a lot of guilt from how he basically gave rise to Robotnik himself by accident and how at the same time he lost what was once a dear friend of his, he probably shuts off his emotional responses to people in a bid to prevent them from getting too close. But hey, enough psychoanalyzing the blue hedgehog for now. <clears throat> I swear I have a life. There's a lot to love about this comic, but at times it can be even weirder than the Archie continuity. To top it off, it has a lot less content than Archie Sonic 2, having been cancelled way before it. However, there is a pretty popular online fan continuation that has been going strong for many years, and has even got endorsement and assistance from some of the previous staff members on the original publication. So that's pretty neat. If you're ever looking for a Sonic continuity with some snippy, cynical British edge, <laughs> hope my British friends like that line, then this is probably your go-to. Or you could go with easily my favorite of the three, my cream of the crop, and what I would argue is a perfect introduction to the world of Sonic, not just in comics, but just in general, seeing as it's even pretty compatible with game canon. IDW Sonic the Hedgehog. It has it all. It quickly gets new fans up to speed with cool organic introduction issues and occasional recap snippets, and launches you headfirst into an incredible first arc, with a straight up Dragon Ball Z tier shown in battle with the crew versus Metal Sonic. This comic is basically everything I would have wanted out of something aiming to replicate the charms of the Adventure Era game continuity. And Ian Flynn's consistently clever writing informed by years of love for the franchise makes every bit of it a total blast to read. It is still pretty early along, only about two arcs deep at the time of this video, so you'll have no trouble catching up. And it's got some of the most consistently gorgeous artwork for a Sonic publication that's ever been consistently attempted. It even has regular art contributions by the author of the popular Ghosts of the Future fan comic, Evan Stanley, who easily delivers my favorite art in the book, really stretching the characters to their emotional limits with expressive, punchy artwork that really knows its way around these characters, their personalities, and what makes them so darn appealing. Ghost of the Future is also pretty good too, but like you're probably not going to be able to get any of that unless you actually have like a lot of familiarity with the franchise. Oh, we uh, we seem to be done. I covered everything I wanted to.
I mean, sure, there's lots of other niche side content, but there's plenty of time for you to get to that once you get your feet in the water, right? I, uh, I guess I could mention fan games, but I mean, you know, those can be really good, but they're still probably best to save for when you've played an official game first, and, um, wow, I kind of got through a ton of stuff, huh? How am I not exhausted? In fact, no, never mind. I am exhausted. It just hasn't caught up to me yet. Oh, wait. What? There it is. Uh, <laughs> ah, my everything hurt. Uh, maybe I'll just let you guys talk amongst yourselves for a while. If that's alright. So my first ever experience seeing Sonic the Hedgehog was the first game over at my friend's place. I'm four years old at the time, and I watched them play it for a little bit, and then they let me play it, and I fell in love with it. But I never had enough time to really get into it while I was over at my friend's place. Later on, my fifth birthday comes around, my entire family chips in and buys me a Sega Genesis for my birthday, along with a copy of Sonic 1. I remember being so happy and excited, and then I finally got to play through that game and I beat it. I have been in love with the Sonic series ever since through all the good and all the bad. It's been a ride. So I got into Sonic through Sonic X. I was like five years old and I saw this two episode DVD of Sonic X at Walmart and I was like, hey, I kind of recognize that character. Let's get that. And uh, so my parents bought it for me and I watched that so many times. My parents must have been so frustrated with me. It scratched all the hell now and I still have it. I still have it. I'm, I'm 20 years old now and I'm addicted to Sonic. I, I still love reading the comic books. I, I don't play a whole lot of the games. Uh, I watch a bunch of the cartoons now. But yeah, I just, I love the world. I love the characters. It's just still so cool to me. I love it. Science Camp, 2002. I was seven years old and everyone around me was too. We were all miserable because our parents decided to force us to spend our free time dissecting squids and memorizing formulas instead of living. But there was a reprieve, 30 minutes a day lunch, and even more than that, the Dreamcast hooked up in the attic. The game of choice was Dead or Alive 2, which I didn't understand the appeal of back then. Unfortunately, I do now. But getting tired of seeing the same girls fighting each other all lunch long, I scoured for another disc. There was one called Sega Smash Pack Volume 1, which I decided to pop in. On the menu, one game stood out by actually showing the character, Sonic the Hedgehog. He looked fast, and I only had three minutes to play, so I went for it. Sonic the Hedgehog on Sega Smash Pack is a terrible port. The sound is horrific, the graphics are broken, and none of that really mattered to me. Getting through a single round of Green Hill Zone, I fell in love instantly. I kept talking about it day and night, I pestered my parents for it for the rest of the year. And that Christmas, when Santa brought me a GameCube, Sonic Mega Collection was tucked into it. I've been a fan of Sonic since I was two years old, playing it when it was new on a Babysitter's Genesis, and I immediately fell in love. Like, the music, the colors, the speed, everything just instantly clicked and I couldn't tear myself away. And even though I was a diehard Nintendo kid and never owned a Sega console growing up, I never really fell out of love with Sonic and he captured my imagination in a way few other series ever did. I don't know what it is, but there is something about this character and the world around him that just seems to bring the creativity out of people. Seeing the countless videos, art, and even full-fledged games created by people who truly love this franchise is genuinely heartwarming, and it continues to be a big reason why, all these decades later, I still adore Sonic and how he's become a constant source of positive inspiration for so many people. God, there's a number of times I've had to do this over because I kept getting rambly. I am so sorry, Marcy. Um, okay, here we go! I first got into Sonic, um, on a whim, actually, because it was on sale in a really big bin at Circuit City for like 20 bucks. And I played a bit of the demo beforehand because sometimes they have demos that you can like play on the console there. And so I was curious and kind of just went all in on it. And what got me to stay, I feel, was the cast. Um, specifically like the, the different character dynamics and whatnot. It had its own little charming personality to it, you know? You couldn't help but get invested in, like, all of their stories. And, like, the lightheartedness combined with, like, the feel of adventure and, oh my god, fish, the music. The music is so catchy as fudge. There's a, there's, there's a wholesomeness to it. There's, like, this, you know, 
this vibe, this something that you, you can't help but just root for everyone, but also get super invested. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no, the time. I think my first dive into the Sonic franchise as a whole came from, I want to say, late 2001, early 2002. They had just ported uh, Sonic 3 and Knuckles on the PC, and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle was coming to the GameCube. And I want to say that was my first time really diving in. Like, I always saw Sonic growing up as a kid. It was just, you know, I was more of a Nintendo household, and like, I'd always appreciate the art, and it wasn't until I actually played those games that I could really appreciate the music as well. So I think, if anything was keeping me here, those would be the two things. Art style, music, mwah. Oh, oh, also guilt. Guilt from being a diehard Nintendo fanboy for the time that Sonic was around, you know, as a direct competitor to Nintendo. That probably has something to do with it, too. Console Wars, man. Dark times. My association with Sonic begins, fittingly enough, for a character who seems to embody primal, subconscious fantasies of unfettered joy and freedom before I can concretely remember. I was born in 1991, same year as Sonic. I've often thought that I was simply fated to have an affinity for this character for this simple reason. Growing up alongside Sonic, I was thus exposed to the development of the character, as it took its particular, peculiar form here in the United States. Starting with the breakthrough, wildly successful, and eminently playable early games of the Sega Genesis, however, like I'm sure many of my generation, for me, Sonic was, then and now and forever after, crystallized and defined by the Sad AM series and its unforgettable cast of characters. To me, Sonic's world was defined by that early period, from 1991 to 1995, by Sonic 1-3 and Sonic and & Knuckles for the Genesis, and the Sad AM series, and then consequently by the comic series insofar as it was a reflection, distillation, and extension of all of this. It was a grand kaleidoscope of imagery, iconography, and storylines that bore the mark or tag of, this is Sonic. And I loved Sonic, so I embraced whatever was presented to me. The primordial soup of Sonic was brewed simultaneously with my developing consciousness and self-awareness. It was Sad AM in the comic series that adopted and adapted the series' world and characters. That became, in my heart and mind, who Sonic was, what he stood for. The Freedom Fighters became primal preschool paragons for me, blending the aesthetic of the funny animal genre with the propulsive sense of proactive action from their video game and action cartoon roots all things that this impressionable youngster took to heart with an innocent glee. And part and parcel of this was, of course, Sonic's partner, his equal, his complement, and his soulmate, Princess Sally. Sonic and Sally are forever and inextricably intertwined in the way that I look and think about Sonic the Hedgehog, more so than arguably almost any other element of the franchise, alongside Sonic himself and Dr. Robotnik. Sally is indispensable in my conception of Sonic. There was no Sonic without Sally and vice versa. So much of the early Sonic paraphernalia seems to emphasize the iconography of Sonic and Sally together. The show's opening title sequence, tie-in storybooks, VHS cassette boxes. In the years since, the passions and attachment that I and so many others have experienced in relation to this character has struck me and stayed with me. Perhaps it's a reflection of how she embodies a different aspect of the heroic potential within all of us that Sonic does. Sonic is joy, unlimitedness, endless possibilities. What a thrill it is to imagine, or to act out the fantasy by playing a game, of being unbounded and moving freely. And what an inspiration to see someone who can do this being kind, good, empathetic, helpful, and applying his internal carefree and chill attitude outward towards others, freeing the oppressed, fighting the oppressors, the fleetest of feet and a warm, knowing smirk on his face. Sally, on the other hand, perhaps represents a similar expression outwardly of a powerful and inspiring inner quality, that of care and concern for and compassion for and solidarity with others. Sonic's innate understanding of freedom drives him to bring liberation to his fellow beings, 
Sally's innate sense of responsibility and deep well of love for others drives her to act for the protection and prospering of those she loves, which can radiate out from her friends who become her surrogate family, to, in this royalty's case, come to encompass a broader sense of the common good. Both Sonic and Sally complement each other because they're ultimately kind-hearted people striving to make a difference, defying the darkness of a seemingly overwhelming situation and making each other better and more well-rounded as they do so by virtue of their unique strengths. This is a powerful demonstration of how we are made better by the bonds of love that we make with others. The deep well of love that continually replenishes the freedom fighters, the bonds of love they share, that powerful sense of family and mutual protection and collective destiny and collective uplift, is an emotional anchor that has always underlaid my appreciation of the Sonic series, and one that I attribute to the foundation laid by Lynn Jansen, Ben Hurst, Pat Alley, and the entire Satayam production team. A fascinating case study in creative alchemy, blending together various different influences and stylistic approaches to create new, fresh, powerful, and lasting art. Now, as an adult, I'm aware that the Sonic franchise has tendrils in many different kinds of media of varying qualities, produced by individuals and intended for audiences from all different parts of the world. This is beautiful and magical in its own way, and speaks to Sonic's universality and iconic nature. Freedom is for everyone, and the character who embodies that who offers a compassionate, and hopeful, and laid-back, unpretentious expression of this ideal, can be endlessly reinvented and reinterpreted. But to me, growing up and still today, the Sonic who battles the oppressive tyranny of Dr. Robotnik with Sally and the Freedom Fighters by his side resonates with me more strongly than any other iteration of the character, all of which I can nonetheless appreciate and admire and be a fan of on their own terms. I think that this phenomenon that I've described is reflective of the high quality of the Sat AM series, the engaging likability, really lovability of the characters, and the deeper thematic truths which are actually endemic to Sonic himself, but which the Sat AM scenario brought out subtly to the forefront. Sonic, who thumbs his nose at the tyrannical Dr. Robotnik and stands in vibrant and vigorous opposition to all of his monstrous and inhuman authoritarian impulses, bringing living, thinking creatures under his heel and heinously stealing away their capacity for free will and failing roboticization, and bringing cold, metallic anti-life to the lush greenery of the earth, is a living embodiment of freedom, and someone who sincerely believes in and fights for the cause, taking the cause, but never himself, seriously. I consider myself lucky, indeed, that I have Sonic, Tails, Sally, Bunny, Antoine, Rotor, Nicole, Dulcie, and Uncle Chuck to look up to. Now, new iterations of Sonic, Tails, and all the others continue to fight the good fight against Dr. Robotnik, and new generations will have responded to it with as much joy, love, and passion as I did to those comics and cartoons of my youth. And I can nonetheless take great solace and comfort and joy in the fact that Sonic and the Freedom Fighters will endure and continue to entertain and endear themselves to new audiences, and that I or anyone else can always revisit my old friends whenever I wish. Via the Sat AM box set, via reprints or back issues, fan art and fan fiction. Here's hoping that Sonic keeps on juicing for years to come. So, yeah. In case you didn't realize it by this point, I love Sonic the Hedgehog. Lots of people, not just me, entire generations love Sonic the Hedgehog. And maybe not all of us love the same Sonic the Hedgehog. And that's totally cool, you know? That's fine. From gameplay styles, to worlds, to tones, to shapes. It really doesn't matter. We're all locked on to each other somehow by our fervor and passion for this franchise whatever part of it we enjoy. I know the Sonic fanbase can seem like a pretty crazy place. Pretty divided and even a little scary. It can be intimidating to wade through not only all the different camps of Sonic fans, but also just the different Sonic media out there. But if you found it in your heart to click on this video and watch to the end, then maybe you're ready. I'm sure something on this list must have piqued your interest slightly more than the rest. And maybe you think you know where you want to finally start your Sonic journey. I'd be happy to say that I've been a small part of it if you do. This place 
can be absolutely crazy sometimes. And trust me, Sonic fans out there, you all drive me nuts at certain points. Make no mistake. But you're all goofballs, just like me. And I love you for it. Sonic's fanbase is nothing if not passionate. And for all the errant internet weirdos, there are a lot of cool people with good hearts. Through the ups, the downs, the all-arounds. I've met some of my best friends through this series, and had some of the most fun with other people here than I've ever had anywhere else. The Sonic franchise is why I ever wanted to voice act as a kid, and now I've done professional grade paid work in the field. Sonic was the reason I wanted to start doing anything YouTube related, and now I have you guys. This franchise, if nothing else, brings people together, even when it can seem like a lot of us are chasing each other off. But whether you're just starting here, or if you've been around for a long time, let me know where your Sonic journey started. I genuinely like to hear from you all on this one. It's a wonderful thing to hear about. Mine started with the Adventures cartoon when I was little, transitioned to the Windows ports of some of the classics, and then onto SA1 with the Hand Me Down Dreamcast. Those were <laughs> wild days, let me tell you. I also really loved listening to the entries that I got audio-wise for the little testimonial section. Um, thank you to everybody who sent one. I really appreciate it. I hope this gave you a good idea of where you want to start if you're interested in the Sonic series and learning more about it. So, thanks for watching, and stay way past cool, everyone. Peace.